Stand with me, we'd like to open up with the first stanza of Amazing Grace. And Larry, this will be awkward. Thank you very much. You may be seated, or if you want to stand, that's okay too. Take a, take a stand. Take a stand on something. He that standeth for nothing will fall for anything. So they say. All right. Hey, welcome to the Victory Bible class. Thank you all for being here today. Uh, don't pay any attention. to That is totally something about nothing, okay? Don't spend a lot of time on that, my friends. But we would like to give a shout out. To those who are listening in on the internet, we have some faithful internet listeners each week, and I thank you all for joining us. Let, let me also say, and I don't have a slide for this, so you'll have to get the audio only, no class next week. When are we not having class? Yeah. Next week. No class next week. In honor of Easter, uh, we will be joining together in, in just a special Easter service to celebrate what? What are you celebrating on Easter? The resurrection of Christ. On the third day, the, the third part of the gospel, Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures. This is 1 Corinthians 15. He was buried, and what, on the third day? Rose again on the third day, according to the scriptures. So there's, there's Easter for you. No, so no class next week. Uh, birthdays this week. We've got Rick Payne, Tammy Hayes, and Jeanette Smith. So I want to wish a happy birthday to all of you. Happy anniversary to nobody. Come on, we got to have an anniversary. Any anniversaries this week? Anybody having an anniversary that we, we don't have a record of? Does anybody wish you were having an anniversary this week? No takers. All right, so happy birthday to you three. Did we miss any birthdays? Any birthdays as I'm scanning the crowd? No birthdays this week. All right, well, happy, happy birthday to you three as well. Um, let me go over the prayer uh, uh, update on the prayer list. Uh, Bob, the Bob Sarver family, as Bob passed away on this past Monday. So that's a prayer request by David Rush. So we have a bereavement there. Um, this is not uh, um, a, a member of our class, but uh, a member of our congregation. Would you give us just a quick update, please? Uh, Becca is in the process of being weaned off the pain medicine. So today and yesterday were very uncomfortable for her. Uh, they were taking, they were making sure she didn't feel anything for several days, and now she's feeling it. So, but that's part of the process of her coming home. She, they're thinking maybe, maybe tomorrow she might actually be home. The nurse said to her, she said, "People who have what you have don't walk; they're paralyzed." And she walks without a walker. She's been doing that for a couple of days. So praise the Lord for God working in her life. Nathan said he's been talking to people about the Lord because of this ever since. So she had five broken vertebrae. Uh, they 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 fused three, if I understand it. My wife will tell me I said this wrong. So, but one of them was it was called a burst fracture. The one near the pelvis completely exploded, and it did that without damaging her spinal cord. So. All right, but she, um, so that's Rebecca for, and she'll be on, you'll hear her name called out in prayer for a very long time. She's going to have quite the recovery. So I just wanted you to know that. She's not in our class, but she is part of our, con our congregation. Uh, all right, well, let's go to the Lord in prayer, and then we'll take uh, another peek at this story we've been looking at for just a few minutes of Jesus walking on the water. So let's go to prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, we give you thanks for the beautiful day that you gave us. Thank you that we have this opportunity to meet together. I know there are many needs represented in this room. If we look deep down in every heart, there's, there's something going on in everybody's life. There could be um, uh, external things trying to destroy us, things like fear, doubt, anxiety, um, there, there could be somebody here who, who has a decision, who needs some direction. Somebody's 
probably going through some physical issues. Somebody's maybe going through some financial issues. I'm sure there's probably some relationship types of issues going on here. There's some pain from things in the past. There's some uncertainty about things in the future. And we know, we know what life is like. We, we've all lived long enough and we, we know these things. And, and Lord, I want to um, proclaim to this class and I want to ask you to meet needs. And may, may we be faithful to bring our needs before you in prayer every single day. May we be faithful, every single member of this class, to open up your word every single day and read something out of it. You've got something for us. You want to commune with us which is still hard for me to understand how a holy God would want to commune with sinful man, but you do. You, you have a desire to commune with us every single day through scripture reading, through prayer. So may we all be faithful in doing that. And I, I just want to pray for the needs of this class. We, we had one update on the prayer list with a bereavement. And I want to pray comfort and strength and hope for that family and just provide the needs that they have and help them to get through this. We pray for Rebecca for, and uh, she's got, going to have a very long recovery, but we give you thanks that she was able to be patched up and just be with her, be with her family, guide them forward through this, this healing process, and uh, supply the needs and give them what they need to make it through. Thank you once again. Bless our time. May our time together this morning be profitable, and uh, may you take your word, take the scripture verses we're going to look at and and uh, put them deep in our hearts and give us what we need to walk daily with you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right. um, so quick, quick recap, uh, Jesus walking on the water. This story we've been looking at, we saw, we saw that the disciples, they're out in the sea, there's a storm going on, and the disciples are troubled, terrasso. And we looked at that anxiety that comes into our life, and that many times leads to fear, phobos. And the, example, the disciples were definitely experiencing phobos and in fact we that that progressed to the point of crying out anacrazo which is the, the same language used when a demonic spirit is inhabiting a body and is crying out that's the other places that it's used in the new testament so there is some serious fear some phobos going on here with the disciples so our question is what what is causing the fear what is causing these disciples to fear? Our first thought might be, well, hey, man, they're out in a little boat in the middle of a lake in a storm. It's dark. There's waves crashing around. There's high wind. And I think that could be something to be fearful of. I think every one of us would be fearful of that. But as I read the text, I don't really see that they're afraid of the storm. I'm sure they are. They, they, there's no way they could not be but what's really driving their fear? Anyone want to take a shot at that? As you look at the text, what, what is really driving their fear? They don't know what they're actually seeing. Yeah. Jesus. When they see Jesus walking on the water, that seems to be, as I read the text, that seems to be what's really driving their fear. Now, these, these, many of these disciples were experienced in storms. They had been out in, in, in the midst of storms all their life. As they were, a lot of them were professional fishermen. They were out on the lakes all the time. And I'm sure the storms are, are scary, but what they saw when they saw Jesus, that is taking them to a level of fear that I'm not sure they had ever experienced before. And so as we, as we um, look at our next slide, I want to I wanna take a look at uh, the word in yellow. You see that? When they saw Jesus, what did they think that they were seeing? A spirit. Now, let's drill down onto, into this word spirit. I'm going to talk really fast. If you guys can listen fast, we'll get through this, all right? So spirit. So when we see the word spirit in the Bible, we, we see the word pneuma. Now, does the word pneuma bring to mind any English words? Pneumonia. And where does pneumonia occur? In, in, in the lungs, and the lungs are used in the body to control what? B breathing. And if, if we look at the, the last uh, bullet point, um, we see a movement of air. Do you see that? It's one of the definitions of pneuma. Uh, look at the first bullet point. That's, that's uh, 
talking about when we talk about the Holy Spirit. So spirit is one of these words that has many definitions. So when, when the translators are bringing it into another language, and this is not just for the Bible, anything that's being translated, they, they can't just pull it up, do a replace all with, with the, the word in the target language. They have to look at, at the context and see what it means. So spirit is one of those words that has a, a lot of different meanings. And uh, so used 385 times. So it's, it's a common word used throughout the New Testament. And it's a word that we're all very familiar with. So um, as we want to go forward, just looking at some, some quick examples of where the word pneuma is used in the Bible. Luke 13, 11. And that's, that goes along with that first bullet point definition. We see the Holy Spirit, the agios pneuma. And we're all familiar with the Holy Spirit. Uh, in, in John 3, 8, I thought this was a really good one. You see, we, we miss this in, in English. But in John 3, who was, who was Jesus talking with? Nicodemus. He, he came to Jesus because he, he wanted to know more, but he came in secret. Y'all remember that story? He came in secret. He didn't want anybody to know he was going to Jesus. And in, in verse 8, uh, Jesus uses pneuma twice. Do you see that? He first uses it as the word what? When. Now, remember, remember the bottom definition on the earlier slide? What did pneuma mean? The movement of air, right. So when Nicodemus is hearing the, the, the word spirit at the very end of the verse, and he hears the word uh, pneuma, at the front, he's making a connection that, see, we would, we would kind of miss that in English. But to Nicodemus, this really drilled this point home, what Jesus was making. So I thought that's a, that's a great verse. If we look at uh, Luke 13, 11, here's another uh, meaning of the word spirit, the, the word pneuma. We have a, a, a pneuma of infirmity. Now here's, here's where pneuma is used of a, an inorganic Object. So it's not that like the spirit inside a man. We, all, we say we have a, a spirit, uh, and, and then there's the Holy Spirit. But th- this is, uh, infirmity is, is a, a weakness, or, or it could be a disease, could be a sickness. So, uh, sometimes, even today, we'll use something like the letter of the law versus the spirit of the law. Are you familiar with that, that saying? Yeah. And so, so spirit, again, pneuma has, has lots of different meanings. Um, Colossians 2.5 there, here's, here's where Paul is talking about the spirit within human beings. See, we are a spirit, a soul, and a body. We're, we're composed of, of three parts. And this is, this is what Paul's talking about here. In Colossians, he's talking about the pneuma. And then just as there's a Holy Spirit, the agios pneuma, in Mark 3.30, and many other places in the New Testament, we see what we might, we might call unholy spirits. What's going on here in Mark 3.30? Well, we might, call, we might call these demonic spirits. And um, rem- remember, the word demon is not a Bible word, but it's okay to use. We all understand what it means, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use that word. We, we live in, in this physical reality, but there is another reality that I would posit that is even more real than this physical reality that we can experience, and it's the spiritual realm. Paul talks about that in Ephesians 6 a lot. Do you remember that? We wrestle not against what? So, so, so we're not, this, this isn't what we wrestle against. This is our physical reality. There's something else, the spiritual realm, and it's very real. And we have uh, spiritual warfare going on. Most of the time, we all kind of bumble through life, and we don't really think that there's spiritual warfare going on because we can't, experience it like we experience this but it's a very real thing Paul's talked about putting on the armor of God there's it's a very real thing we have an enemy so so when we see the word spirit in the Bible what word are we seeing what's our word pneuma except there are two exceptions to the word when we see the word spirit any, any guess as to what two verses might have the exception? The ones we're reading. The ones we're reading. <laughs> How about that? The ones in our story, when, when the disciples were having all this phobos, and they looked out and they saw, they didn't see a pneuma, they thought they were seeing phantasma. It's the only two places this is used in the Bible. What, 
English word is coming to your mind right now. Phantom, I heard phantom. Now, when we think of phantom, we've all watched enough Scooby-Doo reruns. We think, oh yeah, a phantom shows up. They eventually catch him and it's a guy with a bed sheet and eyes cut out and stuff like that. And we don't take the word phantom very seriously. But I hope we can try to, in our minds, get back into this first century mindset. Um, phantoms or ghosts, or there's many, many synonyms we could use, uh, are, are were, were very much in people's minds back then, just like they, they are now. There, there are ghost stories. I mean, we have ghost TV shows and things like that now, but there were actually ghost stories written back then. And, and I, I've given you a couple of examples there. Um, in in our, our next slide, the ancient Hebrew cultures, be, beliefs about ghosts. What, what were the Jewish beliefs about ghosts during this time of Jesus? Well, they, they almost always associated them with uh, a departed spirit of someone who had died. And that's still commonly believed today. Now, I, I'm not saying any of this is, is true. I'm, we're, we're, we're getting into the mindset of what the disciples how, how they lived, what was going on in their minds when they saw this phantasma on the water and why it drove them to a level of fear that probably they had never experienced before. There are two, two types of ghosts or phantasmas that were believed to exist back then. I've listed those for you. There's one that's good and one that's bad. So think of Casper and a phantom, I guess. That was, this is the beliefs. Again, not saying this is true, but on the other hand, was there a cultic, uh, pagan type of practices going on during the time of Jesus, during the time of the disciples, that could have resulted in the manifestations of things from the spiritual realm into our realm? And, and the Word of God is very clear. Those are things we are never to be messing with. Is that possible that it was going on? One verse I'd like to leave you with, just to think about. It's in Luke 24. This is after the resurrection of Jesus. After the first Easter, by the way, Jesus appears to the disciples in a closed room. Now, if, if somebody all of a sudden manifested right here, right now, you can't tell me that you wouldn't be frightened. I would be too. And this is what was going on. And notice the disciples were troubled. We've seen that word terrasso before, haven't we? We sure have. And notice, notice what Jesus said. A spirit has not what? Yeah. So Jesus, by the way, was showing here and many other places that he had a bodily resurrection. That's really important to the context of Easter, a bodily resurrection. But if, if a spirit doesn't have this, then what does a spirit have? Well, we don't know, but it's certainly not human human form was was Jesus saying that there had been potentially manifestations of things in the time of the disciples that maybe they had not seen but they had either heard about or these things were going on occultic pagan types of practices going on and so that in the disciples minds when they saw Jesus they thought they were seeing something from another dimension another world is that possible, that what was going on? What does the Bible tell us about those kinds of things? We're going to stop here. We'll, we'll get into the, some of that not next week. Why not next week? No class next week. All right, in a couple of weeks. Mr. Rick, you are on, my friend. Am I on, Ethan? Okay. I'm on. Good morning, everybody. I guess y'all are going, what's he doing up there? He pops kettle corn. So I really don't know. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, yeah, we uh, popped a few kernels in our time here, but uh, we uh, appreciate we, uh, the opportunity here to teach. It's been a long time since I've done this, so y'all have to pray for me as I go along here. I know there's a lot of, we have a certain amount of time, so I hope I can get it all in. Uh, everybody, I've not met everybody. We've been here a while, but... Uh, We've not met everybody, but we uh, met a lot of people through our kettle corn. Everybody knows us as the kettle corn people. <laughs> they say, you're the kettle corn guy. Okay. So, yeah, but we've been blessed with that. And uh, But I wanted to uh, 
uh, when Brother Dan was called to go to South Carolina, uh, I was, like I say, used to do some teaching. And so I was, uh, I, when we left after hearing that, that was all, it was all sad to hear that. But we know he was called to go. But uh, I just said, Lord, you know, if you need me to, to teach or anything, you know, I don't care to do it again, you know. And uh, didn't think no more about it. I just give it over to the Lord. Didn't say anything to my wife or anything about it. But uh, anyway, um, it wasn't long after that. And pastor called me and said uh, he'd like for me to teach. <laughs> so I had a choice to make. And I said, okay, I'll do it. So anyway, since then, he, he told me, it gives you plenty of time. And I appreciate that. He said it would be towards the end of March. And so I thought, well, let's see, end of March, that'll be March Madness. I can probably talk about March Madness. <laughs> no. <laughs> but, uh, but anyway, but uh, since then, uh, you know, I, and the pastor has preached on this scripture. I think, Ethan, have you got it up already, this scripture? Second um, Peter uh, 1. We're going to read these verses 3 through 11. And I was going to tell you all, some of my notes that I'm getting through this, is uh, y'all listen to David Jeremiah, son? Some do. Um, he comes on every morning. I kind of turn him on as I'm getting ready and stuff sometimes. But he's got a book out called Everything You Need. And uh, it really spoke to me. And, you know, I ordered it, and I've been reading on it, and I've read the whole book. But it's, uh, you know, we have Easter coming up, and we know everybody comes, you know, Easter, it's the most important time of the year to a Christian, you know, and uh, besides Christmas. But uh, David Jeremiah expounded on this scripture, and it really spoke to me a lot. And it's talking about uh, <clears throat> Easter's Easter, of course. It's important, but what do we do the whole 364 other days of the year? You know, what are, are we walking in our walk with the Lord? You know, a lot of people show up on a Sunday, you know, for Easter and all, but... Uh, uh, you know, salvation uh, we have to have, but our walk with the Lord after that. You, you've seen them uh, info commercials that say, and there's more. You know, you'll be talking to say something and say, and there's more. Well, this more is what we're going to be reading about this morning, and it's everything we need in the Word uh, to carry us. And like Mark said a while ago about talking about fear, aren't we glad we got the Word to knock out the fears? The word. And uh, let's read these scriptures together. Second Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 11. It says, According as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by those we you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. And besides this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness charity. And note as we go forward here, every time that the, it's written these things look at this as we go forward these things it says for if these things be in you what we just read and abound that make you uh, and abound they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ but he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins wherefore the rather Brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, you shall never fall. For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Um, so everything we need to, to have a successful life and a godly character has been provided. The Lord's provided that for us. And uh, these scriptures, we all know when we talk about Peter in the scriptures, you know a lot of times he messed up a lot, you know, just spoke out of turn, spoke a lot of things, done a lot of things like that. But as you go through 
the, you'll see that the maturity, and as he wrote here, he, he matured all the way through and he was able to have self-control. To, to, uh, and so it says, I want to read just a few things. This uh, book has been really a blessing, but um, it said, God gives us everything we need because he himself is all we need. And uh, it says, we don't arrive at an immediate spiritual and moral perfection the moment we receive Christ as our Savior. Yes, we're forgiven immediately. We're given the promise of eternal life immediately. We instantly become part of God's family, but growing to maturity, acquiring the divine nature, escaping the corruption of the world and learning to withstand the pressures of life, all that takes time and requires diligence. It says... Um, Everything we need for a successful life and for a godly character has been provided. And it's everything that we're talking about. Everything covers it all that he give us. Everything you need to overcome temptation, achieve maturity, and develop uh, purpose and productivity. Everything you need to be a better husband, wife, mother, employee, employer, all these things. Uh, everything you need to have an exciting personal ministry that will never be in, in vain. All these divine resources are transmitted to you through God's very great and precious promises. So, um, let's go through uh, some of these that he's mentioned here. And the first one in, in uh, here he says in verse 5, and besides this, giving all diligence. Okay, what's diligence mean? It, it, it don't mean it, it uh, not lazy, you know, has drive, you know, diligent. Um, uh, what God's all, he's give us uh, should give us purpose. You know, we have purpose now. We have salvation. We have everything we need to, to go forward and to withstand. Um, this everything that... Uh, Forgive me for reading some this morning, some of this, but I just, uh, this is some good stuff. I just want to show Well, we just read that, everything we need. That summarized. I'm sorry, y'all. Uh, <clears throat> so, in, uh, says this, when you understand what Jesus Christ has done for you, what he can do for you, what he, what he offers you, the riches available to you and the plans and expectations he has for you found for you you found the greatest single motivational motivation for diligent living the world will ever know so our our salvation and what we have and through the word peter's expounding on this talking about that this should give us drive just by what we have in him. Um, it, um, in verse, uh, page 42 here. <clears throat> Y'all forgive me, I'm, I've got a little rust on me, but I'm going. <laughs> it says here, <clears throat> A person of virtue is a quality person, a person of integrity, kindness, goodness, generosity, graciousness, someone who is in generally tries to be above reproach. True virtue is born of faith, but also for the very reason giving all diligence add to your faith virtue. Virtue has its beginning in trusting God and placing your full weight on the worthiness of God's word. So, um, so, <clears throat> Um, when you get saved, let's go on here to, let's skip on down here to uh, virtue. It says, and besides this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue. Okay. Um, that's a, what's virtue? Virtue is uh, behavior, uh, striving high moral, moral standards, um, uh, virtue is uh, something the Lord has given us when we got saved, of course. And uh, <clears throat> I want us to read here. Let's go to some scripture here in, in Proverbs 26, 20. Okay. 
Proverbs 26, 20. God's grace helps us to overcome through his word. And I'm just giving some examples here of how we improve on our virtue. Okay, and what it says, you know, before, you, you all know you cannot control our tongue until we have, have the Holy Spirit helps us to hold, to hold our peace. Well, look at this here. And, you know, before... Um, we might be, uh, before we got saved, could be a gossip. And look at what the word says here. Where no word is, there the, the fire go without. So where there is no tailbearer, the strife ceaseth. As coats are to burning coals and word to fire as to contentious man in, to kennel strife. The words of a tailbearer are wounds and they go down into the midst parts of the belly. So the word can help us, and we and it we can see through the word that how it helps us to know what's wrong and right and prove our virtue, because that's a that's and these are uh, points here. I'm just wanting to read Psalms 46:10 says <clears throat> to uh, be still and know that I'm God. Now that we're born again, we have his word and we can uh, stand on his word. And it says right here, Trust, trusting God with your worries about the future is one of the simplest ways to practice virtue daily. So, and uh, okay, let's go on here in uh, verse, uh, verse where it says also to uh, add knowledge Add knowledge. This is Peter talking. And to knowledge, uh, add to your, it says right here, besides this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue and to your virtue knowledge. Now, what is the knowledge here we're talking about? It's, is it education? Is it IQ? No, it's not. It's, uh, that's not what, what he's speaking of here. Um, it says... Um, Y'all forgive me. I, I, y'all listen to Adrian Rogers. Everybody's heard of Adrian Rogers. Adrian Rogers says, we get as much of God as we want, you know. And that the knowledge we want, we, we get all the knowledge we want by, through our word. And, you know, God, the word of God says in James 1, 5, ask for wisdom and he'll give it to you. The Lord will give you all you want. You don't have to live a life of, of not knowing, you know, the word's there for you. Uh, but uh, it's not possible to add knowledge to your virtue if, if you neglect the study of the scriptures. In other words, it's not possible to get the knowledge. I, I told someone, you cannot, the Holy Spirit can't bring the word back to you if you don't read it, you know. You read it, you get in circumstances and where you've read your word, it helps you to, uh, helps you to carry on, you know. I mean, uh, I know whenever you get into uh, our daily activities and someone really makes you mad, y'all been there? <laughs> and you deal with things. But then I remember reading the soft answer turns away wrath. And that comes to my mind. Well, if I hadn't read that, then I wouldn't have known to have that, you know, adds to you. And it helps me so I don't get myself in trouble. <laughs> you know, and like I read earlier, when somebody, I don't know how y'all, they come up to you and they go, hey, um, did you hear about John? You know, or I'm using that name, I don't know a John, but, you know, trying to gossip, you know. Them verses that I just read a while ago, I just read them, you know, and that's what I was talking about. It says, you know, a tailbearer, you know, and when you, you know, I shouldn't be doing that. 
and the Holy Spirit's convicting me when I'm sitting there listening. How do y'all handle them situations? I think you don't say anything. You know what I'm saying? It's best not to say anything. And that's what we read a while ago. It said, you don't say anything and put the fire out. Just let it go. Because the devil tries to cause separation and tries to do things. But through the knowledge of God's word, we have our daily walk and can, and, and it's a, uh, thank the Lord for his word. Um, the Bible says in 2 Timothy 2.15, study to show thyself. You know, study. We've got to study to show, you know, to, to know and have the word. I think right now we're living in times where people are not reading much or so and fear is all over us. We've got an election year coming and everybody don't know what's going on. We're all, but thank the Lord for his word. The knowledge is there. The word is there for us. And all we have to do is just read and make time for it. And I think you'll see in Peter's life from the time that he first, you know, was called, he would, he would just say anything. <laughs> you know, he kind of, but he hung out with Jesus. You know, he was with Jesus and he learned. And, you know, to be a disciple of Jesus, um, a disciple means a learner. That's what that means in the New Testament. It's a learner. To be a learner. So besides saying I'm a Christian, you could say I'm a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ because I'm a learner. I'm listening and I want to tune in and I want to pick up. So we're, uh, <clears throat> I don't, my time goes fast. But uh, I did say this, yeah, I did mention the, we're in <clears throat> a new political year and a lot of things look so so bad, don't they? But it's good to know that the Lord, it's perfect. It's in perfect time. Everything's falling right into place. You know, we're, we, we don't have nothing to fear. You know, Mark mentioned the fear. You know, we, we, we've got something we can give everybody to let them know that, hey, you know, it's okay. You know, okay, but it's important you know Jesus. You know, it's a good opportunity to talk to somebody about the Lord then. Use that opportunity. He'll, he'll open doors for you when you read the word. It's surprising how that if you open the door, he will, if you, if you say, Lord, give me somebody to talk to today, he will. He'll do it, you know. And uh, let's go on. I don't want to have some time here. Uh, temperance. That's self-control. Uh, Self-control was probably one of the hardest things Peter's mentioning here. And I guess if we all could raise our hands in here, I'm still working on self-control. <laughs> can everybody raise your hand for that? I, I, I really need it. And I've not got this down to an art, I'm just saying. But it is uh, something that he mentions here, that the Lord has given us all we need to control that. You know, he, he's given us everything. Uh, <clears throat> it says here, everything... Of all the chapters in this book, he says, this one might hit closer to home. So go ahead and say to yourself, okay, it's true. I do have more, need more self-control in my life. He says, what, what habits come to mind when you talk about it? Where do you need the most self-control? Is it your temper? Is spending, time management, daily devotions, your work habits, your entertainment or viewing patterns, your appetites, maybe your time? Oh, something, the tongue can get us out of sorts. <laughs> I mean, we think, you know, you can work out, you can do all them things, but one little old tongue, you know what I'm saying, <laughs> can do so much damage. And, uh, oh, but thank the Lord. You know, how do you fix that? Well, you, you, you get in his word and you uh, be filled with his spirit. And that's how you control that. You know, that you cannot do it yourself. And if you try yourself to try to do it, it won't work. But you got to come to the end of yourself, I guess, is the key. It's the key to that. Lord, I just can't control my time, you know. You're the one that's supplied everything for me, you know. And I'm, I'm leaning on you to help me, you know, to, to control what I say. And, and uh, so uh, the, what advantages we have in the Word and Him. Um, uh, I want to... Read, uh, let's see here. Proverbs 27, 27. Let me read that 
I think I got it wrong. I can't see sometimes. <laughs> 27, 27. There it is. Y'all hold on. I did read this. I did a class one time on discernment, and I got on the wrong chapter, and everybody's looking at me real funny. <laughs> and I go, why are you looking at me funny? Oh, I'm in the wrong one. So, but, but, well, evidently I've wrote something wrong down. But anyway, a um, lot of scriptures on self-control. Huh? Somebody say something? Uh, I've thought somebody said something. But, uh, Still a good verse. Huh? It is a good verse. Yeah, that's a good verse anyway. It, they're all good, ain't they? Amen. Yeah. But, uh, but anyway, but, but anyway, so we see all of these traits that he's mentioned, all these, uh, here in the word. Um, the key to getting self control is, what John, John said when he said, he must increase and I must decrease. I mean, that's a fact, you know. If we got us and self and all these things in the way, you know, we say things off the cuff, you know, just blur off, you know. But when the Lord's on, when the Lord's, you're, you know, you're, you, know you, you, you just don't say them things. It's something about it. It's just he feel, you're filled with this spirit. Walk in the spirit is what the Bible says in Ephesians 5.18. Be filled with the spirit. And that's the key to having self-control. Um, patience. A lot of people say, I want patience, but I want it right now. <laughs> you know. So, you know. But uh, I want to read a little thing here real quickly. i got just a few more minutes. I'll... I don't want to hold anybody over. Said patience is our willingness to wait on God to apply His grace to our frustrations and His answers to our questions. Um, we've heard that scripture, those who wait upon the Lord, you know, will renew their strength, you know. And I think when we're pressed down, a lot of things on us, Every day, our everyday deals, it seems like there's more pressure every day. I don't know y'all feel it, but it's, everybody wants it faster, everybody's ready to go, here we go. But um, just be still and know that I'm God, Psalms 46.10, knowing that, that steady, steadiness and the rock, you know, that the world uh, can get to help you and let the Lord work out your problems for you, you know. Just to, just to give it to him. And he can help you have that patience. Um, I think sometimes, um, you know, we need to, uh, the more, well, it's all about our devotional time. You know, that's our strength. And uh, when we have devotions and, and really worshiping the Lord, and he can help us with our patience and have our patience that we need. Um, 